Hey guys, sorry I'm late. Welcome to the State Department. I have a few things at the top. First, on Venezuela. The United States is deeply concerned by the Venezuelan Court of Appeals decision to allow the miscarriage of justice to continue against political prisoner Leopoldo Lopez. Since Mr. Lopez's arrest and imprisonment in February of 2014 and his conviction and sentencing in September of 2015, we have underscored our concern with the unsubstantiated and politically motivated charges brought against Mr. Lopez. We have repeatedly called for his release and that of, um, that of all others imprisoned for political reasons. The United States calls on the government of Venezuela to guarantee the rights of Mr. Lopez and all political prisoners to due process, freedom from arbitrary arrest, in a fair, public, and impartial trial consistent with the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, the Inter-American Democratic Charter, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and Venezuela's Constitution. Rather than silencing peaceful democratic dissent, now is the time for Venezuela's leaders to listen to diverse voices and work together to find solutions to the political, social, and economic challenges facing the Venezuelan people. Next, on the Democratic Republic of Congo. The United States offers our deepest condolences to the families of the victims of the reported massacres that occurred the night of August 13th outside of Beni, North Kivu, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo by presumed elements of the Allied Democratic Forces Armed Group. Congolese authorities and the UN peacekeeping mission are working jointly to determine those responsible for the attack as well as the details of what exactly happened. We deplore in the strongest terms this horrific attack and will continue to support all efforts to end the ongoing violence in Eastern Congo, to increase civilian protection, and to bring perpetrators to justice. And with that, Matt, over to you. Right. Um, let's start. I want to get to Syria very quickly, but I want to start just with Yemen because I think sure. it'll be brief. You've seen the reports about a, an MSF hospital being bombed. But, um, what? What, if anything, do you have to say about that? So we're deeply concerned by a reported strike on a hospital in northern Yemen. We're gathering more information. As we've said in the past, strikes on humanitarian facilities, including hospitals, are particularly concerning. We call on all parties to cease hostilities immediately. Continued military actions only prolong the suffering of the Yemeni people. Yeah, but this was apparently done by Saudi, um, <clears throat> the Saudi co coalition that you guys are uh, big supporters of. Though, is there? Um, <clears throat> have you have you have you raised this issue? This is not the first time that civilian and hospitals have been targeted there. So we remain in close contact with the Saudis on this. Um, we would note that the Saudi committee that was. Um, designated to look into civilian casualties. Uh, the previous ones we've discussed from this podium did share its findings with the UN. We believe that's a step forward in transparency. And as we previously underscored, we also call on them to publicly release those reports. But does does it have any, is there any uh, consequence to this? Well, what, what I'd say is I'm, I'm not going to get ahead of, of any decision, but U.S. officials have regularly engaged with Saudi um, Saudi officials, as, weather, as well as other coalition members, on the importance of mitigating harm um, as part of this. We've also encouraged them to do their utmost um, to avoid harm to entities protected by international law, such do as you, this hospital. Do you, do you know if there is any unease or, or you know, angst about, uh, in this building at least, with the policy people, um, <laughs> about the fact that this is a U.S. supported campaign that I think seems that we, to we continue keep to raise our civilian. concerns directly with Saudi and, and other coalition members. So the answer is no? I think the answer is is that, you know, harm against civilians is always a concern. We always um, raise that issue. Sorry. I'm done with that. Also a school that was there was, there was a school which, you know, the United Nations you know, submitted some sort of a complaint or condemnation. Do you have anything to say about that? I do, and, and we've seen those remarks. We do share the United Nations concern about the alleged strike on the school in Sada, a government on August 13th. We will continue to review information on that strike. You know, regardless of the cause, and, and this goes back to Matt's point, this incident reinforces concerns underscored in the Secretary General's recent report detailing the horrific consequences the Yemen's conflict continues to have on children. Of course. Um, 
You've seen these reports that Russia is saying it's close to a military, uh, joint military action with the U.S. in Aleppo. Is there any truth to these? So we've seen the press reports of the, ref, uh, the Russian defense minister's comments. We have nothing to announce at this time. Uh, we do speak regularly with Russian officials about ways to strengthen the cessation of hostility, improve humanitarian access, and bring about conditions necessary to find a political solution to the conflict. So you say you're not uh, ready to announce anything yet, which means that you're working on, on something? We remain in close touch, as, as we've been very clear about. With the, with the Russians on ways to, as I said, advance the cessation of hostilities, improve the access, and, and to bring about the conditions necessary for a political transition. But, but is there a specific discussion with the Russians about that's centered on Aleppo and yeah. possible? I have nothing to read out on that. Absolutely. So there's no, there, there are no discussions, or I just, I have no information to share on that. So, as part of the broader dialogue that you say you have with the Russians on this, is there anything that you're aware of that involves mili joint military action around Aleppo? There is know? nothing to announce at this time, Matt. When do you expect this to be announced? Hold on one second. We'll go to Michelle and then we'll come to you, Saeed. Okay. <laughs> when do you expect this to, to be announced? Again, I have, I have nothing to announce. You know, we've seen his comments. We're very focused on the three components that I mentioned. Cessation of hostilities, humanitarian access, political transitions, or political conditions necessary to bring a political solution to this conflict. I, I so just I, want to understand. So are you, uh, you you're denying that uh, what he said about, you know, uh, joint military action against militia? I'd also look very closely to what the Russian defense right. minister said himself on that, you know, but in terms of our position, we have nothing to announce. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you are not, you're not denying that. It could, I'm not going to get ahead of anything on that, Michelle. Matt, you had more serious, or was that it? Okay. Yes. Well, actually, I, I'm, I'm completely confused. So there are ongoing discussions that Secretary Kerry is talking about on, but that is not just Aleppo. That is a broader Syria. These are, these are the conversations that we have been having with Russian officials on the three components that we've been very transparent about. Yes. Okay, but he seems to be narrowing it to Aleppo, just Aleppo. Yeah, and I would, like I would refer you to the Russians to speak to what their defense minister said. For the United States, we have nothing to announce. Okay. Syria. Are we going to stay on Syria? Of course, yeah. to gender. Yeah. Um, the Indian External Affairs Minister, M.G. Akbar, is visiting Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon this week. Do you have any comments on that? No, I, 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 I think we would say, you know, it's for a sovereign country to decide, you know, who they speak to. We've been very clear with our position on Syria. Uh, we've shared that with our partners around the world. I'd let the Indian government speak particularly but, uh, to but, their uh, meetings. Uh, we, we are not supporting Assad and, you know, so... Again, that, that would be for the Indian govern, uh, government to speak to their visits and, and the purpose of those visits. Let's stay on Syria. Yeah, yeah very, very quickly. The King of Jordan just gave uh, an interview, I think, uh, this morning to a semi-government newspaper in Jordan, and he said that Jordan is at its capacity. They cannot mm -hmm. absorb any more refugees. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Do you have any... Well, I, I think we've been also, you know, very clear and deeply appreciative of the work that, that Jordan has done in welcoming refugees. You know, we appreciate the generosity of Jordan and the Jordanian people. They're hosting hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees. You know, the United States continues to stand with Jordan. We'll work with the international community on an expedited basis to identify alternative mechanism, especially to address that very vulnerable Syrian population right along the Jordanian-Syrian border. In terms of, of what the king said himself, you know, I would, I would refer you back to the Jordanian government. Thank you. Are we still staying Syria. on Syria? Let's stay on Syria and then we'll get there, okay? All right. Uh, Turkish Foreign Minister said that the U.S. promised uh, Turkey that once the Manbij is cleared from uh, Daesh, uh, PYD forces will leave uh, west side of Europe's Euro, uh, Euro river. And I was wondering if you set any timeline for PYD on this regard, and uh, can you confirm that you are in touch with PYD forces regarding this issue? So what I would say is, is we'll back up a step and let's talk about Manbij and, and the situation on the ground there. You know, liberating Manbij City will cut a key route that ISIL has used to move fighters, finances, weapons, supplies um, in and out of the remaining territory under ISIL control in Iraq and Syria. Um, 
Liberating the city will also facilitate the isolation of Raqqa, which is a critical step towards um, removing ISIL in Syria. You know, the operation complements ongoing operations that the coalition are conducting to reduce the ISIL threat to Turkey by supporting vetted Syrian opposition forces fighting ISIL near the Mara Line and along Turkey, Turkey's border since mid-April. Expelling ISIL from Mambij, but city will also liberate between, we, we understand, 35,000 to 40,000 citizens from ISIL control. You know, the Arabs fighting for Mambij are from Mambij, and they're fighting to take back their homes. The Kurdish forces are a critical component of the SDF. That said, we do have commitments from Kurdish leadership that the local Arabs liberating their own lands will be the ones to rebuild the area and restore local control when the terrorists are finally evicted. Um, I think that answers some. Okay. And uh, one more question. Sure. Uh, the leader of Kurdish National Council, Ibrahim Biro, was kidnapped by PYD, I think, on Saturday. And later, uh, he was freed on Iraqi borders, and he was, he was forced to leave Syria. Uh, I was wondering if you have anything on I that. Have, I have I've not heard of that report. I'm happy to look into it. Actually, I was emailed that question on Saturday. Was okay, it? let me look into right, that. Thank you. Are just, we staying on Syria? One more just quick follow-up on Syria. Uh, would you endorse or encourage STP forces uh, uh, to go westward and go after uh, Al-Baf, very near in a city. Is there some coordination between you? So ask this again. Would you uh, encourage STV forces to go westward from Manbij area uh, to Al-Baf and other, other cities? Okay, in terms of sort of operational components and what the SDF is doing and where they're taking the fight to ISIL, I'm just not qualified to speak okay. to that, I'll be honest. Do we have more on Syria? Related to Syria? We'll do related to Syria. That okay. was close, Abigail. Um, I know you guys love talking about politics. Um, Donald Which Trump I won't. Is speaking right now. He's speaking about his new immigration policy, and some of the things that he's speaking about are adding um, the government using questionnaires, social media, interview with friends and family. Uh, it sounds like things that are already being done in the screening process. Do you, do you have any, uh, do you think any of these things are missing right now from the current process? Um, I wouldn't speak to political rhetoric from, from any campaign. Um, what I would say is, as we've spoken from many times on here, is we stand by the integrity of our visa process, um, and I'll just leave that there. Are we, any more on Syria? He's basically talking about some sort of an ideological litmus test. For people with that. Yeah, work. again, I'm not going to speak to, to what political candidates. Okay, may but is that really that. any different than in the very old days when they used, to say, they used to say, Are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Is that similar? You know, I'm not going to speak Thank to you. that side. Any more on Syria? I have, can I come back to the, the okay. issue of this? Just one more thing. I uh, think that I heard you say this, but I just want to make sure. But your response to the question is essentially there, you don't think that there's anything wrong with the visa system the way it is now. And that you're, you're, com that you're confident in, in, in its ability to, to um, screen out people that might be a threat as it exists. I, I would say two things on that. And, and actually, thanks for the question. You know, we've said from this podium, I've said from this podium many times, is that we're constantly looking to adapt the visa program, um, as well as our screening, as well as uh, the information we have, as the world changes. That said, and, and this is what I said earlier, we stand by the integrity and the scrutiny of our visa program. So, yeah. I'm going to come back to this issue of these, the reports on the joint military action. You're not yeah. denying that, you, you're not saying well, this no, is not going to take. As I said, we, we talk to the Russians all the time, Leslie. We talk to them on those specific components. You know, speaking specifically to your question on what the Russian defense minister, I, I have nothing for you on that. I've not seen the defense minister's comment. I've just seen um, Sergei Lavrov's comments. Okay. Um, I, I think it actually started with Defense Minister Shoigu, but, but okay. I just I just have nothing for you on that. Okay. So, but you're not denying that the that that's I just, just have not, nothing for you, nothing you on that. On we remain point. in close contact with the Russians on the three components that are the main focus of our work right now. Are we done with Syria? India. Okay. Well, I, hold on. Let's let's do this. Let's go to Afghanistan first. Thank you. As you know, nowadays there's conflicts or rift between Dr. Ghani and Dr. Abdullah. Abdullah has uh, become quite bad. 
do you have any comment about that? And also, do you think that the U.S. need uh, to send some delegation to Afghanistan to solve their problem in this sensitive time? You know, so big, we've seen well. Chief Executive Abdullah's public remarks regarding President Ghani and the government of national unity. We remain supportive of a government of national unity. We encourage both President Ghani and Chief Executive Abdullah to work together to pursue these common goals. Mm -hmm. Are we still any more on Afghanistan? Okay, let's go. Well, I'm sorry. Just on that, I mean, mm -hmm. this was one of uh, what Secretary Kerry says was uh, points to as a as a, as a big mm -hmm. achievement, not just of his, but for uh, the administration as a whole, mm -hmm. engineering this kind of president and chief executive agreement. Is there a concern that the, in this building that that is unraveling? No, we, we, there's not. We still think that there's work to be done, but there has been concrete and significant progress in Afghanistan since the government of national unity. We do remain in touch with uh, the Afghan government, um, and we will remain in touch as they move forward. Yeah, I, I know, but you're serious. Really, there's no concern at all that the, that the, that the progress is in danger? I, I wouldn't say that at all, Matt. I would say, you know, we've seen the comments. You know, we believe the government of national these, unity these has made significant progress in Afghanistan. Uh, we believe that that's the path forward, and we continue to support it. These are the comments where he basically threatens to pull out of the government. Yeah, we've seen those. Yeah, and you're not concerned about them. We remain in close touch with them on these particular comments as well as the future So you are the government. concerned that there might be a problem? I'm not going to characterize it as concern, Matt. What I'm going to say is we think that there's a lot of work to be done, but we believe a lot of progress has been made. Uh, one more, one more. Hold on. Are we on Afghanistan? Afghanistan, one more question. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Madam, uh, does Afghanistan support uh, U.S. drone attacks from their soil against Pakistan? It has started again because they were stopped in the in the past, but now there are again uh, drone uh, strikes are going on. I, I wouldn't speak to that, Goya. Okay. Go ahead, Steve. Hey, on Zambia, the yep. opposition is challenging the results of the presidential election, alleging boat rigging, riots are breaking out in the South uh, yeah. today. Uh, does the United States uh, recognize the results of the uh, re-election of uh, President Lungo? So the United States welcomes the Zambian citizens' democratic spirit, which was characterized in voting on August 11th. We congratulate President-elect Edgar Lungo and call on all candidates to show leadership in respecting the official result as announced by the Electoral Commission of Zambia. We do encourage all Zambians to maintain the good conduct exhibited during the vote, and if they have objections to the results, to use the approved legal mechanisms for peaceful redress. We do note the statements by many of the International Election <laughs> Observer missions, which highlighted concerns with the pre-electoral environment, specifically increased violence and restrictions on freedom of press and assembly. We hope that the government will address these concerns in the context of future elections to strengthen Zambian democracy. We have a strong partnership with the Zambia and with the Zambian people. We look forward to advancing our shared interests. I'm, okay, are we? I think we're done with Zambia. Let's go here. Uh, Elizabeth, so, question about these documents that Fox News has obtained, we've shared with you, um, showing that just weeks after Secretary Clinton left uh, office, the State Department expressed interest in acquiring the property owned by the brother of a major Clinton Foundation donor who we talked about last week, Gilbert uh, Shiguri. Um, the expression of interest also came within days of former President Clinton touring the property. Um, what can you tell us about this? Okay, so you're asking specifically about Lagos, about Nigeria, just for context. Okay, sorry. For this. Yeah. No, it's okay. <laughs> so um, a few points, okay, that I'd like to make of this. As of today, as of right now, we have not contracted or acquired property for a new consulate in Lagos. The site search for a new consulate in Lagos began in 2011 as prioritized by the Capital Security Construction Program. Many of the potential sites under consideration by the Department to include the Eco-Atlantic Development were identified by an independent international real estate firm, as is typical in site searches around the world. The Eco-Atlantic site was identified, as I said, by an independent international real estate firm in 2012. 
Our site search process, speaking, speaking specifically about this, but also generally on how we operate, is managed by career real estate professionals in the Bureau of Overseas Building Operations with input from independent real estate firms and other department stakeholders to include diplomatic security and overseas posts. Career professionals evaluate and score potential properties under consideration before any property is put under contract. This robust process was followed in Lagos as it is around the world. Over the last several years, as we have identified and evaluated multiple properties, the department has had conversations with multiple property owners and their representatives about the possibility of acquiring property for a new consulate in Lagos. The department does not comment, however, on the specifics of ongoing real estate negotiations, which this is. Thank you for that. Just quickly, so if the process started as early as 2011 when Secretary Clinton was still um, in office, was she aware that Eco Atlantic was among one of the sites being pursued? I'm not aware she was. Okay. And then lastly, um, was this a decision that Patrick Kennedy would have been involved in? You know, at you this stage when it is a site search, I, I specifically mentioned who was, that's the career professionals in OBO. It's diplomatic security. It's an independent real estate. You know, in terms of who in leadership would be aware, this is a very preliminary thing. We do this with all of our sites around the world. So. Okay. Thank you. Can I just? Of course, ma'am. Well, the, 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 you, you still don't have any property, but the process started in 2011. That's five and years. Is this? That it is. I would say that in some of our posts around the world, acquiring property that's um, appropriate for the, the type of facility that a U.S. consulate or in some cases a U.S. mission, a U.S. embassy requires, is a long process. But I do note it was 2011. Yeah. But so they've been in negotiations over this specific property I, for five years? No, not negotiations. No. What they've been is they've been looking for a property, identifying, taking a look at properties since 2011. Not just this property? No, multiple properties. So when did this property become uh, involved? So it was identified, when did it get into the mix? It was identified as a potential in 2012. So it went on for a year before, and now it is the preferred I, actually, I can't tell you it's the preferred because of so many of our, we don't comment on specifics of ongoing real estate negotiations on that, but I, I would say we looked at multiple. Them. This one was identified in 2012. But, so, in other words, then negotiations for the sale of this property has been going on for four years, not five. I can't say that this is the preferred site. I know, but as in, as, 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 as a property that is in the mix or it, you know to, to or, be, or I would say assessment I would say you know taking a look at the requirements I'm not sure if any of you guys have been to our consulate in Lagos um, you know this obviously is a priority but but I do note it has been since 2011 well, you can't be that much of a priority if it's taken five years to well there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of very specific as you well know. I know okay. I know it are we like good on time. this one just, just one what you're saying is that you can't talk about the inclu inclusions. Can you talk about the elimination? Is, is this I can't property? actually talk inclusion or exclusion. What I can do is, is say that, yes, this was part of the galaxy of options that were considered. So it's still there or not that you can't say? Um, we can't speak about specifics. Right. What I would say is that it was brought to our attention as a possibility by an international independent real estate firm in 2012. Iraq, okay, wait. More on this? Yeah. Okay, on so you guys, let's wrap this up and then, and then we'll move on to Clinton. foreign policy. Um, so congressional members will soon be receiving notes from uh, former Secretary Clinton's interview with the FBI. Was the State Department in consultation with the FBI about the release of this, these notes or of the transcript to congressional members? Did the State Department express any concerns or do they have any concerns now about the release of these notes? I'd say the State Department respects the FBI's desire to accommodate the request of its committees of oversight in Congress, just as we do with our oversight committees. We have cooperated and we will continue to cooperate with the FBI every step of the way. Anything true? more on this? Yeah, is it true that the State you Department... You are the king of follow-ups today, today. Is it is it true that the, FBI, uh, the, the State Department is not happy with the FBI for not sharing these notes with the State <laughs> Department and instead sharing? Um, 
I characterize it this way. You know, the State Department has asked the FBI that we be kept apprised of information provided to Congress that contains sensitive information related to State Department equities and for an opportunity to review it. Um, such an opportunity for review is in keeping with standard interagency review process when dealing with another agency's documents or equities. Uh, for example, we routinely provide the FBI with the opportunity for such a review when we're considering providing to Congress information relevant to their equities. Uh, additionally, just to that point, the State Department honored the standard practice during the 10 months we worked collaboratively with the, within the interagency to process the nearly 55,000 pages of former Secretary Clinton's emails for a public release. Uh, the State Department has already cooperated and continues to cooperate extensively with Congress directly on matters related to former Secretary Clinton's emails. We have provided Congress with copies of upgraded emails from the Clinton email set. Numerous State Department officials have conducted voluntary interviews with various committees, and obviously we've been in frequent contact with Congress on these matters. But the question was, is the State Department not happy with the FBI going ahead and sharing and not sharing with the State Department I, I would say what I said again is we respect the FBI's desire to accommodate mm -hmm. the requests of its committees of mm -hmm. oversight in Congress. We have cooperated. We will continue to cooperate with the FBI every step of the way, and any suggestion to the contrary is false. So, one more follow-up on that. So, the State Department has not had the opportunity to review these notes before they would be released to Congress? Um, <laughs> at this stage, it's my understanding we're still in direct touch with the FBI on it. I just don't have an update for you on that. Okay. Iraq. Are we so done on this? Different subject. Okay. We're done on this. Hold on. Let me go to Laurie, because I already got you, Steve. Okay. Over the weekend, Kurdish Peshmerga forces crossed the Greater Zab River and liberated a dozen villages from ISIS control. So it looks like the liberation of Mosul is really approaching. And both uh, President Masoud Barzani, the Kurdish president, and General David Petraeus have spoken of the need to plan Mosul's post-ISIS mm -hmm. governance. After meeting with Special Envoy Brett McGurk over the weekend, President Barzani said that the people of Mosul will not accept the old order and that drastic changes are necessary. General Petraeus has called specifically for establishing, <coughs> establishing a provincial council to represent the diverse peoples in, of Mosul. Can you give us some idea, some concept of, of how you see the governance of post-ISIS Mosul now? Okay. Well, one, a, th a few things on this. For, for both President Barzani as well as uh, General Petraeus, you know, they would speak to their own comments on that. And I'm not going to characterize their comments either way. Um, I would also say that, you know, it's our understanding while huge progress has been made, you know, um, the situation in Mosul still does remain fluid in some ways. We can say, however, that we have confidence in Prime Minister Abadi in his efforts to promote accountability and transparency, combat official corruption, and to build more inclusive institutions. As we've said in the past, long-term stability in Iraq will require the government in Baghdad to be responsive to the needs of all Iraqis. We've worked hard for many years to support that effort. Uh, you mentioned Special Presidential Envoy McGurk's visit, um, recent trip to both Baghdad and Erbil. He reaffirmed the coalition and the United States commitment to provide assistance to the Iraqi campaign to defeat on the battlefield, but also after the battles are won with essential stabilization and humanitarian support. But the exact dimensions of that stabilization hasn't been worked out yet. Yeah, Is that what it's, you're it's, saying? You know, I, he did note the recent pledging conference, as you noted, that would go through the UN. We had that conversation on that. In terms of the exact mechanics on that, no, I don't have a, I don't have a readout. So Are a, we on yeah, 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 on the very same point, sure. because also uh, McGurk said uh, that uh, you know the, the future governance of uh, Muslim uh, mm -hmm. is should be decentralized somehow. You know, I mean, those were his words because that's what the government wants, it wants decentralization. Does one, is one to understand that you are sort of encouraging some sort of a confederacy within Iraq, that it would I be, know, it I would be divided into regions and, what, what? And, and governance and so on? No, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize it as that at all. That's mm -hmm. for the government of Iraq to say. Right. What I will say, though, is that we need a well-coordinated, right. well-meshed up 
political, mm -hmm. economic, mm -hmm. and, and stabilization plan that, as I mentioned to Lori, mm -hmm. accounts for the needs of all, re all Iraqis. Mm -hmm. But he did mention the word decentralized. Yeah, I would. I haven't seen his exact remarks, but thanks for that, Sayed. Are we doing Iraq? Sure. On Brett McGurk's visit to Erbil, uh, he met with, I think this is the first time he does this, he met with every single major party leader in the Kurdish region, including the opposition leaders. Can you explain why he did that? I've got, I've got a brief readout on that. So he... Um, I'll start at the top because we'll start with Baghdad, then we'll move down. A special presidential envoy for the Global Coalition to counter ISIL, Brett McGurk, and his deputy, Lieutenant General Terry Wolf, visited Iraq for meetings with senior Iraqi government and security officials. Um, he commended the Iraqi security forces as well as the Kurdish Peshmerga for their achievements on the battlefield. He welcomed the recent events, as we were just talking about, with the Kurdish Peshmerga east of Mosul and Iraqi forces south of Mosul, which are helping to shape the conditions for Mosul's ultimate liber uh, liberation and stabilization. He also outlined the recent increases in U.S. and coalition support, including support for stabilization in those liberated areas. In meetings with the governor of a new Niniwa province, the Niniwa operations commander, and other leaders involved in the planning for the libera uh, liberation of Mosul, he emphasized that importance, as I just mentioned, of a well-coordinated military, political, economic campaign plan. The United States and our coalition partners are committed to working with all Iraqi leaders, to your question, to ensure this plan is well-developed. So I think this is, a, this is a, one of those instances where when you see the opportunity to go into a recently liberated area, you see the need for that well-coordinated, well-meshed up, meshed up plan that requires the support of all those local leaders. That's the sort of communication that we continue to have. There's some a political crisis in the, in the Kurdistan region, and some people, some commentators from the region, have explained the meetings between Brad McGorg and the opposition figures in Kurdistan, uh, not just the people in power, uh, as you know, some sort of uh, interference on the part of the United States to bring the, those parties together yeah. uh, to solve this political crisis. Do I you know? would actually take it as a different way. You know, I would, I would interpret that as the view that the United States stands behind the people of Iraq, all Iraqis, as they continue to take a look at stabilizing and rebuilding the city of Mosul. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, are we more on Iraq? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, on Saturday, August 13, Widat Hussein Ali, reporter for Raj News uh, Agency, when, was found dead in Duhok, Iraq. And according to some news reports, Widad was kidnapped by some un unidentified persons in Duhok, and a few hours later, he was found dead. And according to some primary investigations, he was tortured, tortured to death. And this is not the first time um, for a journalist to be killed in the Kurdish region of Iraq. I am wondering to see if you have raised this with the Kurdish security officials, in particular for, this, for the killing of this journalist, and also the previous ones who were killed and the perpetrators were never found or tried. What's your, what is your stance on that, please? Okay. Well, first we would offer our condolences, obviously, to his family and friend. You know, the United States anywhere in the world, but particularly in areas um, where transparency um, matters. You know, the importance of, of journalists and brave journalists on the front lines, you know, can't be overstated. In terms of the investigation on this, I'd refer you to local authorities. Um, I just don't have any insight into that. This has been said before. Whenever incidents like this happen, they commit a committee for it, for the investigation, but it seems like there's no result or the perpetrators were never brought to trial. I'm really curious about what, what is your stance on freedom of press and oh, targeting journalists course. specifically. I think you know our stance on freedom of press and you also know our particular? stance on accountability. You know, this is something we raise around the world, not only in Iraq. Okay, are we done with Iraq? Okay, let's do Asia. Okay. Go ahead. So the question about Taiwan, the, uh, the interior minister is going to inspect Itu Aba Island, the Taiping Island, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, does the State Department have a comment on it? And did you receive any notice from President Tsai or her administration? Okay, about it? so I'm not going to speak specifically to, to that visit, but I would note our uh, 
full position, which we've said repeatedly from this podium, is we call on all South China Sea claimants to avoid actions that raise tension, to take practical steps that build confidence, and to intensify efforts to find peaceful diplomatic solutions to disputes. Mm -hmm. Okay, more on Asia? Uh, more on Yemen. Okay, wait, let's do Asia, let's wrap up Asia. Steve? Uh, have you had any indications that uh, Pyongyang is no longer recognizing a Sweden as the protecting power for the United States? Sweden remains our protecting power in the DPRK. It is important to realize, though, that the United States government has no diplomatic relations with North Korea. We have no means to provide normal consular services to U.S. citizens there. The Embassy of Sweden in the North Korean capital is the protecting power, as I mentioned, for U.S. citizens, providing limited emergency consular services to U.S. citizens traveling in North Korea. However, even when requested by the Swedish Embassy, the DPRK still routinely delays or denies consular access to U.S. citizens. Do you notice any sort of change as far as their attitude towards the Swedes from as what I, you just said? As, as I would say, you know, it's routine that they do deny consular access. Are we, wait, Asia, go ahead. Um, earlier today, uh, 10 South Korean congressional members landed on the disputed Takeshima Islands in the Sea of Japan. Uh, do you have a response, and are you concerned that this might set back uh, reconciliation efforts of Japan and Korea? Okay. You know what? I haven't seen that report. Let me see if I can get a response for okay. you on that. I just want to follow up. Sure. So, um, does the State Department see the, the action that are in We call on all claimants to reduce tension. I'll leave my comment where I stood. Okay. okay. So did you get a, get any notice from Tsai, though? I have no conversations to read out <clears throat> on that. Anything more on Asia? India. Okay, hold on, Goyal. We'll get there. Abigail? India is Asia. Thank you. <laughs> Abigail? Can you confirm reports that a U.S. tourist was killed um, during an earthquake in Peru? We are aware that a U.S. citizen was killed during the earthquake. Our condolences do go out to his family and friends. Out of respect for the family during this difficult time, uh, we have no further comment other than to express our deepest condolences to all those impacted by the earthquake. We're monitoring this situation and we remain in close contact with Peruvian authorities. Okay, now we're going to Asia. It's all you, go ahead. India, okay, thank you, madam. A uh, very simple question. Today, yes. India celebrates 70th Independent Day. And I think you saw the Secretary's statements marking their independent day. Yes, ma'am, I did. Uh, my question is, uh, President of India, Mr. Mukherjee, talks about development and moving forward, including India-U.S. relations and also mm -hmm. the rule of law, human rights, and uh, uh, 1.2 billion people, world's largest democracy, still standing tall. But on the other hand, Prime Minister Narendra Modi said the first time this is something like happened, that uh, the Kashmir in Pakistan, or mm -hmm. this call occupied Pakistan Kashmir, is part of India, and they are all Indians, and time has come now to speak out for those who are depressed or stressed by the military there, and now thousands have been demonstrating inside Pakistan, but what they are saying is that uh, they are not allowed to speak out by the military government and so forth. So what, uh, have any comments about this uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's comment that now he has directed the Indian uh, Foreign Ministry to look into this? Okay, well I wouldn't speak um, to Mr. Modi's comments, that would be for him to speak to. Um, our position, as you well know, on Kashmir has not changed. You know, the, the pace, the scope, the character of any discussions in Kashmir it's for the two sides to determine. We support any and all positive steps that India and Pakistan can take to forge closer relations. Uh, we're aware of the clashes. We remain concerned about the violence, and we encourage to um, all sides to make efforts to finding a peaceful resolution. Finally, because so far uh, any demonstrations or demonstrators <coughs> were only against India or against uh, Kashmir in India, but never uh, ever. Uh, in the occupied Kashmir in Pakistan, even those people were standing here demonstrating against the 
uh, Pakistan at the Pakistan Embassy. So what do you think, is, is this a time now for State Department to look into that part of Kashmir also, whose people are want to speak out, but they are... Uh, I, would, I would leave our comments on Kashmir where I left them. We do <coughs> remain concerned about the violence. Thank you, ma'am. Of course. Two questions, quick question on Turkey. First one is, uh, today Washington think tank uh, talk about uh, nuclear <coughs> weapons in Injirlik base in Turkey and it states that terrorists or other hostile forces uh, may capture these weapons. Also, there is a, a briefing at the U.S. Congress about the same subject. Uh, are you concerned about uh, nuclear weapons? I would weapons? refer you to the Department of Defense to speak to them. Okay. Second question is today, a uh, committee to protect journalists stated, declared <coughs> Turkey mm -hmm. as a top a, a journalist jailing country. Uh, about 42 journalists right now implicated as the coup involvement with the coup and mm -hmm. jailed and about 100 also on the detainment list and total journalists are 77, 78 <coughs> in Turkey. I was wondering if you have any comment on this. Uh, okay, I don't have a comment on that specific uh, specific <coughs> report. Uh, what I would do is reiterate what we've said many times from this podium: as Turkey's friend, as NATO ally, as partner. Um, you know, we urge Turkey to abide by its constitutional commitment to fundamental principles such as freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, due process, judicial independence. Um, these are key parts of any healthy democracy and a key part of Turkey's own constitution. Okay, Turkey? Turkey? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in Turkey particularly, anti-American rhetoric was discussed here last week. I'm sorry, one more time. Yeah, uh, anti-American rhetoric in yeah. Turkey mm -hmm. was discussed here last week, uh, which sparked after the coup attempt in Turkey, and particularly on Gülen's extradition, mm -hmm. whom Turkey thinks uh, was behind the coup attempt. And uh, I was wondering how the State Department sees this anti-American rhetoric in Turkey can be solved, and uh, do you have any idea what uh, U.S. can do regarding I mean, we spoke about this at length last week. I'd, I'd direct you to that transcript. You know, of course we're concerned about it, but we remain in close touch <clears throat> with our Turkish allies as, as part of this dialogue. I just don't have anything to add to that. One more. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to go back to Yemen. Okay, so hold on one second. Can we wrap sure, up Turkey? Sure. Yes, uh, related to that, the, the foreign minister of Turkey said that he, he got some uh, positive signals or mm -hmm. positive feedback about the extradition process, uh, given the fact that on Thursday you said in general that uh, extradition processes could, uh, could, uh, uh, could be years. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, what, 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 what are these uh, positive I, signals? I yeah, I couldn't speak to his specific comments, Nicola. What I would say is, you know, what we've said before is the extradition process is very formal, it's legal, it's governed by a treaty. We will abide by that treaty. Um, you know, I just don't have updates for you on that. And uh, Fethullah Gulen uh, wrote uh, an opinion piece in, uh, <laughs> in the French newspaper Le Monde uh, where he said that he's, um, he would like to have a kind of international investigation set up by an international committee uh, to investigate about the, the, the coup d'etat uh, and he said that he would be ready to take part to this uh, investigation. Does it, does it change your position? regarding his, uh, his stay in, in no, the United the, States? No, our extradition is governed by the treaty, and we will follow that treaty. Are we done on Turkey? Well, how about I'm sorry. the general point of him wanting an international investigation? Is that something you think is a wise idea, or are you confident that the Turks We're confident in our extradition process, that, that any um, no, information... No, no, this has I'm no, sorry, go ahead. nothing to do with extradition. Okay. Has to, I mean, it has to do with Gulen in that he is calling for an international investigation into the coup. Is that something that you think is <clears throat> wise? Is it necessary? Or do you have full confidence that the Turks can do their own investigation and prosecute those responsible without uh, any kind of violations of due process or rule of law? What I would say is that as the Turks continue to work through this, we understand that they um, will continue to prioritize their own security as they seek to hold accountable to those who are responsible for this failed coup. Um, we have raised our concerns on issues of, of due process and transparency um, in terms of an international 
you know, investigation, I would refer you to the Turks. We wouldn't take a position on that. No. Turkey, are we all done? Okay, then I'm going to go to Yemen and then I'll go to you, Abigail. All right, so just to clarify earlier what you said about Yemen in regards yeah. to the hospital bombing this morning, you are, you are, is it fair to say that you're not coming out and condemning the attack? You're saying we're raising concerns with no, the coalition. No, of course we would condemn any attack that, that hit civilians. We're gravely concerned by any reports of civilian casualties. What we're saying is we've seen these reports, you know, um, of, of course we would condemn. Um, any any strike against a hospital. Okay, because I, I mean I've been hearing you all say for months now that we're raising these concerns with the mm -hmm. Saudi-led coalition, um, but this is this is the fourth attack on an MSF medical facility in Yemen in mm -hmm. the past year, let alone countless others on clinics and hospitals. Um, are you concerned that these sort of stern conversations aren't having the desired effect? Well, what we would say, and we'd point you back to to what we talked about earlier is. You know, the Saudi-led coalition themselves have taken a look at these. They have done reports. One of those reports, I think one or two, has been turned over to the UN. We've also called on them to make those reports uh, public. Mm -hmm. And so there is more transparency in that accountability. You know, we remain gravely concerned about civilian casualties anywhere in the world where they occur, and Yemen is no exception. Mm -hmm. and, and just one more. Um, sure. You all have... Uh, called on all parties in that conflict to help facilitate the free flow of humanitarian aid, we correct? Um, so on Friday, the Saudi-led coalition uh, bombed a bridge leading to Sana'a mm -hmm. that uh, Oxfam says uh, is used to convey 90 percent of humanitarian aid to that city. Um, what do you have to say about that attack? Do you condemn that attack? We have seen those reports, and if the bridge was deliberately struck by coalition forces, we would find this completely unacceptable. The bridge was critical for the delivery, as you note, for humanitarian assistance. Destruction will further complicate efforts to provide assistance to the people of Yemen. Okay, thank you. Great. How do you whether it was deliberately or not deliberately attacked? I think that this is one of the, um, the ongoing investigations that we'll take a look. We continue to get reports from the ground. We'll also be in touch with the coalition partners, um, and, and we'll continue to gather information, Said. I'm asking whether you, the United States, has a, an effort on its own to determine whether we, we would have a We would have an effort um, in that is cooperation with our international partners there. But yes, we also do Saudi have our own sources. Including the Saudi-led coalition? Yes, that would be one of the sources we get information from. Abigail. South Sudan. Yes, and I'm glad for this. Um, there was a fairly disturbing account put out today uh, of the July 11th attack on the train hotel compound. Um, and um, as part of it, survivors are saying that they waited for hours uh, after calling for help from the U.S. Embassy as mm -hmm. well as other embassies in the area um, with no one responding. Do you dispute that, and do you have any timeline that you can share with us about what occurred during the time during the time of the assault? Okay, so um, I think we've all seen those horrific reports. Um, I want to say at the top that privacy considerations will prevent me from talking about any specific part of this in detail. But as I go through this, I do not in any way want to minimize in any way, shape, or form what people might have gone through during that crisis in South Sudan. So in terms of the timeline, in the midst of the ongoing fighting throughout the city between government and opposition forces, Embassy Juba actively responded to the July 11 assault on a private compound hosting U.S. citizens, among others. Upon learning about the attacks at Terrain Camp, Ambassador Fee immediately herself immediately contacted South Sudanese government officials, including officials in the Presidential Guard and National Security Service. National Security Service sent a response force to the site and put a stop to the attack. Presidential Guard forces also went to the scene, but they arrived after the National Security Service. Following the attack and in the midst of ongoing fighting and violence throughout Juba, including in the immediate vicinity of the embassy, the U.S. Embassy ensured that U.S. citizens and foreign nationals affected by the attack were moved to safety and provided emergency medical assistance. The U.S. Embassy also facilitated the rapid departure of those involved from South Sudan by air ambulance. As part of its response to the crisis in South Sudan, 
The U.S. Embassy provided emergency services for those in need and assisted in the departure of more than 80 U.S. citizens during last month's crisis. We've stated we condemn these attacks. We have called for accountability for those who are involved in the violence. Anything more um, on South Sudan? So you can't confirm that Americans were singled out um, and were specifically assaulted due to the fact that they were American in the course of the assault? Um, I'm not in a position to say that, that any particular nationality was singled out. Uh, and as part <coughs> of the report, it you know, suggests that it was South Sudanese, Sudanese soldiers who were, in fact, you know, committing this assault. So how was the U.S. Embassy, how could they be assured that the people that they were calling were the ones who were actually going to help rather than contributing to the ongoing? So what I can say is that the attackers in this incident wore uniforms and they were armed. There were both opposition and government troops in Juba at that time. Armed clashes were occurring throughout the city. The area where terrain is located was controlled by the SPLA on July 10th and 11th. Matt. Yeah, I just wanted to, you said that the in the midst of the ongoing in, uh, attack, mm -hmm. the, the terrain, um, you said the Embassy Juba actively responded. We so did. the active response, though, as far as I can tell from what you said, was that the ambassador made a phone call. Is that? The ambassador made several phone several calls, phone calls. Um, when we were assured that people would go out and bring people in. Then we actively ensured that those people were safe. Right, but, but in the midst of while, while it was going, I understand yeah. what you're saying. After mm -hmm. after it was over, what you did, but during it, when when we received there... reports, we called the people who were best poised to go out and <clears throat> make it stop, which was the National but, Security Services yeah, as well as the I mean, presidential. But was it just the amb ambassador, or did other people, did other staffers do do, do anything? I mean, I'm just trying to yeah, get an in, idea in of what the of active sequence, response was. It was, it was reaching out to the government officials who were in a position at that place. So I think that the, 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 the point that at least the survivors of this are some of the survivors of the attack is, is mm -hmm. there there wasn't any kind of, any attempt to intervene. Is that not I, appropriate? I, or you know, it's again. <clears throat> there was um, an immediate response from the U.S. Embassy to um, identify and dispatch the people who could intervene immediately in the attack. Right, but the embassy itself is not in a position was to do anything? Was not in a position to do that. One more. Sir. Can I quickly go back to Japan? Of course. Um, earlier today, uh, several ministers of the Japanese government, as well as uh, an envoy for uh, Prime Minister Abe, visited the uh, Yashikuna Shrine, which enshrines all the soldiers who were lost in World War II, commemorating the fact that uh, the 15th of August was when Japan surrendered to the Allies. Uh, the Chinese government, the Korean government uh, were very unhappy about that, and I was wondering if you have a comment to that. So we continue to emphasize the importance of approaching historical legacy issues in a manner that promotes healing and reconciliation for all parties. We believe, as we've said before, that strong and constructive relations between country and the region promote peace and stability They're in their interests as well as in the national interests of the United States. Just one short follow-up. Does it at all frustrate uh, the U.S. government that the tension between Japan and uh, Korea or Ch uh, Japan and China are rising when the tensions between the United States and China is rising uh, regarding the South China Sea? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do sort of a geopolitic Sudoku there. You know, what I would say is that we continue to call for regional stability, regional dialogue. You know, certainly um, that's of primary importance not only to the U.S., but the region. Abigail, you had one more. Quick more that's on okay, South of course. Sudan. So did the embassy then reach out to the U.N. peacekeeping force or try to uh, in, get the U.N. peacekeeping force there quickly? Is there any follow-up to that? Any concern on the part of the U.S. about their handling of the situation? So we've raised the incident with senior officials in the U.N. Department of Peacekeeping Operations, as well as the Secretary General staff. We will continue to seek clarification on the U.N.'s response to the events on July 11. So, okay. But can you say whether the embassy then did try to reach out and get the U.N. peacekeeping force? I have no information on that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm sorry. <coughs> one more, guys. 
I just never heard that phrase before. Can you explain what geopolitical Sudoku is? <laughs> it is. It's a great phrase, isn't it? That's okay, can fun. you explain what it is exactly? I think I think it's it's the complicated math of, of regional tension. I thought the whole point of Sudoku was it wasn't complicated math. It depends on what version of Sudoku you do, Matt. Thanks, guys.